But hello, guys. Welcome back to the Improvement Season podcast with me, Pascal Flor, and my man, Steve, all on the other side. Say hi, Steve. Hi, guys. Hey. Hi, so, guys. Yeah, hey. So, it's the week before Steve is leaving us. Not for good. He's only away for a holiday. He's going to Greece. And that's why we decided to actually record two sessions in a row. That is the first one. Second one is then afterwards, obviously, right? And um, yeah, so not that you're wondering why we are wearing the shit, same shit all time. <laughs> it's basically just because we are recording two weeks in a row. Uh, two, two sessions in a row, right? But uh, what is it we wanted to talk about here today, Steve? So, we actually rambled for so long before we actually hit the record. Yeah. Um, before, yeah, actually, it was like I said, it would be interesting stuff for the listeners, I think. But um, this first one is going to be, we'll recap our weeks. So what's going on right now? Although there's probably not too much to say. Probably more interesting on your end because you're actually dieting, which more things happen over a frequent period of time. Whereas my end's pretty dull. And I've already gone over my plans Going forward, I'm pretty sure I've done touched on that, so I won't keep touching on that. Um, but nothing's really changed on my end. Obviously, just deloading this week. Um, we could talk about, well, obviously, what we were going to talk about, and we'll roll on to this, is going to be kind of using holidays as deload weeks, or, um, well, I guess we could talk about training on holiday, so properly actually going and consistently hitting your sessions. And then what I'm probably planning to do, which is going to be like an active recovery week, basically. Um, So yeah, this week's just been deload, which is actually, I won't say too much, but it's been really nice to be able to just focus on work. um, So I don't feel stressed whilst I'm away because I've got everything I needed done and kind of feel very stress-free on that. Mm. So how's your diet gone this week? Man, everything is going really smooth. Uh, Lee and um, yeah I I can't really complain I mean I'm in such a good spot and it's funny because during the week we both talked about it or via whatsapp that when you when you failed in the past something it doesn't matter what it is and you approach it another time then you always have some kind of anxiety going on and that was the same with me when I actually started uh, that cutting phase because I was just like, am I really ready? Um, have I overcome what has happened like at the beginning of the year? Um, what if if my willpower isn't there? Can I rely on my, I don't know, my drive to push through it and st- stuff like that, right? And I mean, I'm in such a good place that no hurdle has um, appeared in front of me. It's going so smoothly. I'm actually dieting more aggressively than I planned to, but simply um, it happened automatically or naturally because, I mean, I'm busy throughout the day. Then dinner time, I'm always eating with Katie and Hugo. And after that, it's already late and I don't have the tendency to then eat another time right before bedtime and I have to get up at five in the morning. So everything is going so smoothly. It's it's already a little bit frightening because it's going so well. I'm now sitting at 88.4 kilograms here in the morning. Um, came all the way back down from 93.7 it's where I started three weeks ago or two and a half weeks ago first of almost and um yeah i was i was really hoping when i stepped on the stage uh, on, on the on the scale today and i was then looking at instagram a couple of hours later the instagram story especially yours i was really hoping that i'm below you when it comes to the way in but it didn't happen here today <laughs> but it, it will come in the next day so yeah <laughs> i'm holding tight at 194 pounds which, yeah i don't know would... what that is in kilos I think it's it's basically also oh, around eighty eight kilo yeah. eighty eight point two or something because I was really really hoping that you have a higher weigh in date <laughs> and I have my lowest weigh in date here today <laughs> so I was really hoping like today is the day today we are crossing path but it didn't happen and although we talk I I always feel really bad because I feel like um people think people like we're being hypocritical because uh we're talking about the scale and like talking about being happy about different weight loss and then we tell people not to like to ignore that not to ignore it but realize it's only a data point so i always like to bring that back in that 
like Pascal is not just focusing on just the scale coming down. Um, it's the fact that actually you did talk about one of the other data points is kind of performance. I think you're getting towards your overreaching week and yeah. you said you weren't sure if you were kind of getting to a point where you'd need to take a deload. Yeah. So um, this, this was now week three and so I really still pushed it hard because I just wanted to discover my barriers or how how far I can push it in regards to the volume because my training and my mentality, how I'm approaching training and also the execution of lifts and stuff changed drastically to what I've been doing like one year ago, right? And that's why I can't really compare the situation with my former self from the beginning of the cut last year to my present self, how I'm cutting now, right? And what my volume landmarks are. So that's why I, I still want to approach the gym with, okay, hey, come on. I don't need to fear burning out. I don't need to fear overtraining. And if so, I, I do know how my body reacts on certain things. And I, I can read the symptoms or, or the indicators when you are approaching something like an overreach state, right? And that's why I just said to myself, come on, don't be too afraid. Really push it hard. And also, it's funny you brought that up because when I did a coffee ride right before we got on, I thought about... Um, the training session and the the um, increase in volume because there have been a couple of times where I was just like, okay, am I increasing the, the set number here for this training session or do I keep it steady? And sometimes I think I, I fooled myself because I thought like, okay, rather don't do it because you don't want to burn yourself out because you're in color deficit but i think it was just because i was a little bit lazy that i said to myself like no rather not burn yourself out but it was more so the sensation of fuck do i really want to spend that much time in the gym because when i increase the set numbers it first and foremost gets harder and second of all i spend more time in the gym early in the morning do you really want to do that ah rather not right and i justified it for myself probably with telling myself that i don't want to burn out or overreach quickly and um yeah this is something where i changed my viewpoint a little bit and try to remind myself that i still have a lot of leeway before i'm actually truly overreached and when the time comes i can still pull, pull back and f furthermore I'm not that deep into a cut where I should feel super fatigued already and stuff, right? I should still progress just fine right now because it's not it's not really a mini cut or anything, right? Um, and yeah, that that's basically how I approach training right now and also the change in mentality I'm working on for myself. And as you guys can tell, I mean, we both are constantly trying to evolve as well and we, we don't have everything in check ourselves it's it's a constant learning process and every once in a while you also need to remind yourself why you're doing it and whether you are floating along on a comfortable um i don't know boat instead of really getting into a motorboat and driving down a river or something right uh, it really like I had lots of thoughts on what you said and I think it's really good to have been honest like that uh, like we're always honest on this podcast but it, it's really refreshing to hear because I'm sure the listeners will be there'll be some of them that will be thinking the similar thing and um, whether or not they should be pushing it or not and I think your concerns of obviously your dieting so your recoverability is going to be hampered so to push it you could be legitimately concerned and I actually think your um, logic of not necessarily I don't know if it's necessarily lazy, but some people might think, I don't want to do an additional set because actually the cost isn't worth the trade-off because there is diminishing returns in terms of increasing number of like set volume. Um, so you do get less payback from it. But obviously, even when you're dieting, you get the payback of hopefully maintaining more tissue and also burning more calories via doing that. So kind of there are many kind of pros and cons to yeah. increasing your sets. Can I just say something before I forget it? Yeah. <laughs> and that is um, that when when I'm getting in there, right? And this is something I ask myself: Am I am I really at a point where I can easily overreach and overtrain? 
Probably not, right? And who am I kidding other than myself in that situation, right? It's just, of course, we want to be in a comfortable situation, right? Of course, we have to push the boundaries to further progress. That doesn't mean that you need to follow something blindly you know, or always need to go hard or go home or something like that, right? But I think that when you've never tried, you never know. And in that case, what I was doing, like the, the past couple of weeks, basically, right, was I was in a comfortable spot where I was just like, yeah, well, everything is going fine. I, I said it, I, I told myself that it's enough and that's all I need, right? But this isn't the state where you want to be all the time. You sometimes really need to get out of your comfort zone and really push yourself hard, like you you always talk about functional overreaching, for example, right? That every once in a while, maybe it is a good thing to just try to see how far you can push it. And this is just something, yeah, I, I needed to remind myself of that. I just got too comfortable over the past couple of weeks. Yeah, I think if you if you don't push your limits, you never know what your limits are and you don't necessarily learn. So I think that is a really important thing. And yeah, it's something I've, I've had during, I think when you have a coach who's doing all of this for you, it's great because actually you just outsource that thought mm. process. And I think so for those people that coach themselves, and we probably talked about it on that podcast where we talked about being self-coached. Um, if you let this really hamper you or you overthink these sort of things and these details, then it's like not a, like it that's not cool because that's going to really probably hold you back quite a lot and cause you a lot of stress and anxiety but i've had weeks where i'm kind of because obviously i control my own training so i've had weeks where i'm kind of not sure whether or not i want to add that extra set or not and depending on fatigue levels and things and normally it works itself out because yeah the week before i'm planned to deload nine times out of ten i'm gonna deload the next week and it oh, very rarely am i like oh yeah i could i could push out another week um and yeah it's just important to be honest with yourself in those sort of situations i i'd actually be interested do you know i not off the, yeah maybe off the top of your head kind of for maybe you're pulling or you're pushing what your sort of set numbers are looking like for a week right now i don't sorry because too many exercises have changed over the past couple of months so right now i'm not barbell squatting anymore um i'm not doing any kind of conventional deadlifts and simply the fact that these two exercises are out of my training protocol right now change a lot of what you're able to do with the other exercises okay. simply because your systemic fatigue the seeding of it has just gone upwards like by a long shot yeah. right and simply because of that i simply really don't know how far i can push it but what i can tell is and this is something uh, you already knew and i already knew is that my back volume is much more limited than my chest volume for example i i need to do so many sets for my chest just to feel something right but for my back i already can feel that that common spot here even that I'm not barbell back squatting right now. I can feel that it slowly flares up. And that, that is only due to pulling movements, right? And for my chest, it's I trained it yesterday. Could could train it here today. Based based on the sensation, uh, I don't have any kind of severe fatigue or severe soreness going on. Only when I really push my chest here on the side, I can feel it slightly, right? But when it, when it comes to my back, my back is already, I would say, slightly overreached. Mm -hmm. um, and my, my legs could be pushed a little bit further still, but I think that my quads will probably be able to, to, to take so much more than my hamstrings and my glutes. Yeah, I think especially when you haven't got squats in there, like people try and like a set of leg press versus a set of squats. It's, you could almost say two sets of leg press equal one set of squats. Mm -hmm. Like squats are just that much more systemically fatiguing, not necessarily on the quads, but just as a whole. So um, that's a really good point that you talked about is something I really think that's important highlighting here is you've talked about volume landmarks and where yours are. And we've already seen them change from your intent and how you're approaching training. And then also now from different exercises being in and out of the program. So I think that's really interesting for the listeners to kind of have a thought process about in that 
like we always say, these aren't rigid numbers. They kind of are a bit dynamic. And it's more of a, the way I like to think about it, I think you're the same, Pascal, is it's a form of theorizing and auto-regulating your training mm-hmm. rather than kind of a hard and fast rule or anything like that. I have a question for you, Steve, and that is because over the past couple of weeks, that's why I became so much more analytical again and so much more aware of where where I'm currently at and thinking about my training, if everything is correct for me, is that the quote-unquote optimal way to go for myself. And I had the feeling that I'm not taking enough care of my programming and my nutrition in the sense of that I'm not analyzing it enough. And what I mean by that is not just look at the numbers, but also look at the exercises, the execution. Um, Am I actually adding, I don't know, load or am I adding a repetition or something like that? And I don't know, do you fall into the misconception that you think that you're not doing anything but now that i'm self-reflecting upon the changes i've made i realized that i actually did still work on improving and and changing variables yeah i think that is, i think that's completely what it is it, it in a weird way it's reminding me of one of my clients this morning posted a side by side of when she started with me to how she is now and she'd just been following the process which has taken her to a goal. And when she goes by side by side, she's like, oh, actually, when I reflect, there's been huge changes. And sometimes you have to do that because I find it the same. Like I set my thing up and then I just go and I don't spend much time analyzing and assessing things like every week. And it's more, I look back over a period of time and I'm like, actually, there's, I'm sometimes shocked by how much process, how many, um, how much progress I've made. And I think if you know, you're, I think it very much, and we, we talk about this to the listeners a lot, is if you're nailing those kind of priorities every single day, then there's, there's no chance that you're not kind of moving in the right direction. And sometimes you, you kind of get, you feel like you, I think sometimes people do get complacent with it. But if you check now uh, regularly enough, I think you're, you're probably all right. Mm. Well, I always, <clears throat> in that situation, uh, find hard is to compare yourself um, with your former self in, in regards to your progress you've made because in bodybuilding the only thing that really counts is that you're changing physically like yeah. physically right it doesn't really matter whether you're putting load on the bar yes there's a slight correlation that the more load over time you're using like progressive tension overload over time right but um, as a matter of fact because you're going through cyclical approaches where your strength varies all the time as well i'm always coming up and then falling down again coming up and falling down again i and when i'm only looking at the numbers Right? I always feel like I, I don't progress and I don't know if that's the same for you. And this is where, where I have a hard time really stay in my lane because I think that I'm not progressing, but probably I, I, I still do. But because I'm going into a cutting phase, then I'm losing again a little, or a little weight or more weight. Automatically, my uh, strength levels decrease simply because for me, as you guys know, I gained much more weight than I planned to, but also along with that, much more strength came, right? And when I'm now in a prolonged cutting phase, it will probably come back down quite drastically once again. Yeah, it is, it is really hard because I know when I first started out on my contest prep for last year, I was kind of worried that I hadn't made any progress and I spent a long time comparing photos um, probably a disgustingly amount of time where it really became quite like very self-centered, almost to, like narcissistic in a way. Kind mm-hmm. of really, I was really analyzing them. Like, have I made progress? Have I looked better here? Have I looked better there? And in the end, when I got to stage, I looked noticeably different. Like it was really obvious. And sometimes I think it is one of those cases where you just have to trust the process, trust that you, when you really are being honest with yourself, have you been working hard? Have you been kind of doing what you should have been doing? Um, And the results will show themselves because I even look back at, like we've talked about execution. My squat is probably actually not any stronger than what it was maybe two years ago. 
But when I look at what how I'm performing the squat, it's completely different. And then when I took it, the, look at the whole volume that I'm doing within my training, that's completely different. I probably the week one volume that I do at the moment is probably what I typically would just stay at always. Yeah. Whereas now I go much higher. It's it's really a good point you brought up there with the execution of the exercise because when I'm looking back like two years ago, I actually used more load with nearly all of the exercises. But the execution, there wasn't any kind of mind muscle connection going on, not by any long. Any I didn't even think about it. <laughs> no, really not. I was just moving weights from A to B and um, using a lot of momentum along with that. And yeah, so the load, uh, so on paper, I actually um, regressed. But I know for a fact that my quality of each and every single repetition has gone up by a, a huge amount, huge amount. And it's funny because I just recently saw the discussion that study from Brad Schoenfeld, the uh, high volume study, right? And everyone is just jumping on board. And the back and forth between Lyle McDonald and James Krieger and Brad Schoenfeld was just crazy, by the yeah. way. Yeah, I mean, if, if you guys haven't seen that, just check out uh, Lyle in his group and also James Krieger when he jumps on that and especially Brad Schoenfeld's post. Um, just crazy discussion. But what I wanted to say is actually that James himself said that uh, when it comes to a quantity is not the important thing, but quality always comes first. Yeah. And then when quality is in check, you can add the quantity. And that just stuck with me, right? Um, because it is so true. And this is first something I came to realize over the past like one year, to be really honest. No, yeah, it's completely true. And on, yeah, that, that whole thing and the whole discussion was crazy. But, um, James's write up eventually was to address Lyle's points was just insanely good. <laughs> James mm -hmm. is a, a great practitioner and just like a true scientist. Uh, but you know, it is completely true. I think a lot of people, when they hear like volume is the key to hypertrophy, that's kind of with an understanding that you're doing a sufficient amount of intensity. So you might say intensity is king, but then people miss understand that and then they just go for intensity progressions over anything else whereas obviously it's you no know, you set your intensity then you go with your volume same with like it's not just volume before quality it's make sure you're doing it right and then go with it um, and this is why and i love that our facebook group our team group that is with our clients there's so many form videos because mm -hmm. I encourage every single one of my clients, I chuck them in there because I need to make sure you're doing exercises right. Because I bet there's a lot of online coaches who end up having clients or, and I'm not saying there are definitely is, but I'm sure there's people that are doing programs without the, the quality, without the, the form in place. Uh, and so they're not getting what they should out of the program. It's very easy to do shit tons of sets of calves if you're just bouncing off your Achilles every single set because your Achilles absolutely. can take a beating. And this is also something that changed in my coaching philosophy that I'm much more often um, um, requesting some form videos, especially when the numbers just look odd to me, right? When, when there's just something like, I don't know, five sets of squats, 10 repetitions, everything is just steadily at an aria of three, which is like... I don't know what the correlation between or, or the, the, the comparison between one exercise, let's say the bench is really high up there, even higher than my bench, maybe, right? Where it's just like, yeah, okay, I'm not saying that I have the highest bench or something, but you, you get the idea when someone is only like training for one or two years, then approaching to you, have a squat of 100 kilogram and then is benching like 120. That seems odd, right? And that has changed my co coaching as well, massively, how I approach things, how I actually talk with my clients. And funny enough, uh, Valentin Tambosi uh, just recently made a, a, an Instagram story where he talked about that, like most of his coaching time right now, because he's always requesting form videos with his clients, like 20, 20 hours or something, he brought up a time uh, frame per week goes into only watching form videos. What? 20 hours? Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> that's a yeah, long that's a, time. Yeah, that, that's much more than we do. But um, I, I can see the validity and why he's actually doing that. Because I think that 
when the program is solid, when the nutrition is solid, right, everything is kind of, all the boxes are kind of checked, but the, the form isn't there. Yeah, right. Yeah, and that's, that's, a fundamental. that's a variable that needs to be in check as well. That's why I can understand why he's always kind of requesting that from his clients, like many, many exercises each and every single week. It's kind of like a, a an update on your physique, basically, right? Well, Valentin's a hypocrite because uh, his form's terrible. I couldn't even say that with a straight face. I'm sorry. Um, I don't think he'll even be here. There's no chance of you watching this anyway. But um, that was a joke. But that is, I think there. Are, I, I wanted to bring up because we talked about using excess weight and whether their form was any good. But I've also had it where um, to flip it on its head, where people almost focus so much on form that then mm. the load is not enough. And I'm like, you're you're like a big dude like i've got clients who are big and they're strong guys and then they're using very little weight and i'm like you can probably use more than that i need to see that's why the form videos are so helpful because we can see their intensity as well which is something that i wanted to bring up as well we're looking at their technique and their execution but also their intent because sometimes um i think a, a really common thing i see is people and more novice trainees is they're just quite loose on maybe their eccentrics and they're not controlling that to the to the full extent hip hinges they're kind of just falling down and they're not really getting that you can't see them really like stretching their hamstrings out mm. and getting that painful stretch um it becomes quite obvious quite immediately uh so we call them call our clients out if they're not training hard enough as well but lots yeah. of them do train really hard <laughs> yeah and especially something with heavy compound lifts where they are trying still to get some kind of a muscle response so that they are trying to feel it, I don't know, in their yeah. glutes or something, right? Where it's just like, nah, come on, you're doing right now a conventional deadlift. Nearly all the muscles in your body are working right now. Only focusing on one will probably be detrimental for the form and execution anyway. Yeah. Or you're moving so slowly just to feel it, especially there, that you are shooting yourself in the foot because you can't progress and, and progressively overload over time because you can't really progress and unload anymore. Yeah, yeah, there's a there's a fine line there and bodybuilders in and for technique wise, then it's not like powerlifting. We don't have to be as precise as they are. We just need good workable form with great intent. And um, that's really where it comes to. Like everything, there's there's gonna be a a bell curve where we want people to be and where we don't want people to be. So no, I think that's, I don't know if there's anything, we're already a uh, half an hour in. We've had a good discussion oh, there on yeah. something that we didn't intend to talk about. <laughs> yeah, what, what was it? I, I totally forgot again what we wanted to talk about. So we first. were going to come over to um, <laughs> talking about the, I think we can talk about something quite specific here. So rather than just talking about active recovery phases, we can mm -hmm. specifically talk about planning deloads um, around holidays. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are, well aware of planning a deload for your holiday and that's something i've certainly done with clients i've certainly done with myself um but just from my own personal experience especially this time around and other times of deloading whilst on holiday i'm wondering whether that's always the best case and whether or not sometimes it isn't because i know in my pr contest prep for example i was deloading when i was like visiting charlotte's family and stuff and i mean if it wasn't contest prep, I think it might not have been the best thing because I was exhausted when I was there. I was not myself. I didn't really enjoy the hot, like the, the period of time away very much. Uh, and it just wasn't very much fun. And I think I would have much more enjoyed it if I deloaded the week prior, had much more energy for it and could actually like enjoy the time with her and her family. And I think in a scenario of non-contest prep where you don't have a deadline, I don't see that being a detriment because we just don't take active recovery phases very often. Um, like it's a good excuse to be busy and be able to do that. So at the moment, I mean, uh, I'm deloading and then going away next week and I'm coming to like, I, I'm at peak mass. So that's actually a really kind of nice time to just let myself hold this higher body weight for a longer period of time. Uh, let things kind of heal up, let my body really get kind of unused to the high volume that it's been pounded with for months and months on end. Um, I don't know if that spawned any ideas on your end, Pascal. Yeah. Um, so how did this idea come to your mind that you are now deloading before the holiday? Um, yeah. So how did it start actually? I had just planning out my mesocycles. I hit a five to one accumulation after my primer phase, which 
kind of happens sometimes after my primer phases and with clients, they seem to be able to accumulate for a bit longer. But then the last two have been four to ones. And I knew when we were going away, but I just kind of started my mesocycle. I just progressed through it. And I just was adding some sets, adding some load, pushing the RARs. And after last week, I was just like, there's no way I can do another week of overloading training. I'm not sure I could even match last week. So I knew I had to deload before going. So doing it this week, I've then realized that with the amount of work that I've had to do, like with clients and I'm sure other like jobs and careers would be the same way. If I was trying to do overreaching training, I just have such a stressful week um, for next week. And then that made me think about, well, what are the benefits of actually deloading the week after? I mean, (laughs) deloading this week in that earlier on in the week, I was because sometimes I try and reduce my caffeine intake during a deload, I was struggling to do that. I was like, I still need caffeine. Uh, Like I was having um, Utopia (laughs) from De Novo, shout out, um, to like help me get through my day. Yeah, shameless plug. Um, And halfway through the week, and really only today and yesterday do I feel more normal, like recovery-wise, like I actually feel pretty good. And that's already my whole holiday almost would have been over by then. So you just think how, how, what are you missing out on by just being so fatigued whilst you're on holiday then? So it had a few benefits of, I think I'm going to be really energetic next week and really be able to enjoy the whole time on holiday and not worry about any of kind of, yeah, how tired I am and not be able to enjoy things, anything like that. But also I think everyone knows like the week before holiday, the week after you go on holiday, you basically have one and a half times the amount of work because you can't just get rid of a week of uh, Mm. work. So it's just allowed me to have that extra time this week. And so it's become a really, really like nice way to go on holiday and be really distressed, uh, (laughs) de-stressed, like low on stress rather not distressed. Um, Because I'm going to, I know I've set up my clients. I know I've done all my work for like social media. I've got podcasts set. We've got the podcast set up and things. And I also don't feel knackered because I actually feel very refreshed. So it's actually quite nice. And then it furthered my kind of justification for it because I go on holiday maybe once or twice a year for a week. I think having one of those as an active recovery phase, one week of in a year is probably actually maybe more optimal than not having any. So um, even if you have one or two weeks where you're active, having just active recovery, I don't think that's actually going to be detrimental to you. So yeah, with all those, I, it's a hard sell for me though, because I love training hard. I know at the end and whilst I'm away, I'm going to want to go train hard. But I just, I, if I can get a session in, it will be like one or two and I just, I won't have any time. So it just can't, it will have to be an active recovery. And that's the way it has to be for me. I kind of had have to force myself. I couldn't do it if I was at home. So yeah, those were my, that's how I came to the thoughts. Yeah. I have so many thoughts on that one because first and foremost, I think it's a, it's a good idea to set it up that way because it absolutely makes sense where, when you really think about it, it's like you laid out that um, we all know the feeling going into a deload and the first half of the deload we are just dragging our ass from a to b simply because we are still so overreached and so fatigued from from the previous microcycle that we can't possibly do anything and then flying sit at the airport then i don't know all the traveling also accumulates even more fatigue and then the first half of the or maybe even the entire holiday when you're only a week away it's just like not enjoyable at all because you're still so fatigued and so overreached. So it absolutely makes sense to actually do it that kind of way. And especially when you actually think about that on the active recovery phase, it's maybe one or two times per year a week. That's probably in the long term and for longevity only beneficial, right? Then instead of looking at it in a negative perspective, because I know that people will do that like, I can't possibly not train, right? I need to train because X, Y, and Z. Um, Turn it around and say, okay, sure, now I can't train, but probably it will give my tendons, my ligaments, all these kind of body parts also time to recover and heal. And additionally to that, the just accumulated fatigue inside the body in it for itself, I can totally completely get rid of and then after that i am so much more fresher to then go hard again i mean yeah i i completely agree and i 
I've really had a hard time with it because I've had to, sometimes I think you do things, you try and sell yourself it. So because I'm the one doing it, I was like, am I just trying to sell myself this? But the more I thought about it and when I talked it through with you, it was just making more and more sense in that unless you're in a contest prep where mm. you have a timeline, I don't see that. And even if you can plan it into a contest prep, I think you'd, I would have way more enjoyed going on like holiday during my, like going to see Charlotte's parents energized yeah. because yeah, it's just, it will be really like, like you said, when you go the first half of a deload week, you are just really tired still and beat up. And that's not a nice feeling when you're on holiday. And then when you're thinking about, especially when it's not comp prep, if you're having a deload week before you go on holiday, potentially you also bring calories to maintenance. And that week can still be a bit hard, but you're still a bit hungry. You're still quite food focused. So then by the end of that week, you kind of relieved a fair amount of diet fatigue. Then you go on holiday and you're much more responsible. You don't have so much diet fatigue. Your metabolism maybe has come up a little bit so you can do better with more food and not risk so much excess fat gain. And then if you're trying to look better, you've also replenished a load of glycogen. You probably like look fuller and more muscular. I can only think of lots of benefits in that regard as well, because I think a lot of people like diet hard down into a holiday and then they kind of go into it and end up binging and like feeling like crap and maybe eating too much and they're not looking their best at all. They kind of just end up looking sloppy. So I actually think that cleanup, like maintenance deload beforehand is actually a really responsible approach from that aspect as well. Also, when you just keep it in mind that I, I'm always speaking about longevity, at least for myself. I plan to be in the sport for as long as my body allows me to. Right? And in that case, when you really think about it, I want to be in the game for the next hopefully 20 or 30 years. When you count that up, let's just theoretically say that you take one active uh, recovery week per year. Count that up. <laughs> tw- 20 in 20 years days. that's 20, 20 weeks 20 weeks and that's that's nothing in the time span of 20 years it's not even half a year right it's just nothing really it's a drop on a, on a hot stone right thus i think it will probably not make any kind of detrimental uh, impact on your overall outcome or progress Quite the contrary, I actually think is the case, and that is that it will probably do you some good. And I always like the saying, I think, I, I don't even know whether it was Mike who came up with that, but uh, the committed athlete knows that he needs these breaks. And it's not about, oh, yeah, but I'm so hard, I'm, I'm just a machine, I always work all the time, right? And if you don't do that, then you're just a wussy. That's not the case. A committed athlete knows that he needs to take the break every once in a while. He knows that he needs to take the deloads so that he's able to then really progress and further improve over time. Yeah, it's exactly what I always say to clients is like, yes, one part of the deload is to recover from what we've just done, but it's also to set up many more weeks of hard training. Um, And it's kind of like if, if you don't feel like if you don't, it's almost like if you don't feel like a bit of dirt in your deload, then you probably don't need to have taken it yet. And you maybe haven't pushed quite as hard as you need to. Obviously, for our listeners, that's most of them, but there will be maybe some who are a bit more novice and maybe yeah. that's not appropriate. But um, yeah, I, I don't really have much more to say on it. Although I'm just really looking forward to going to Greece and pounding uh, uh, baklava, <laughs> shish kebab, <laughs> and uh, hummus. Vlaki. Suvlaki, yeah. yeah. Pita bread. I have one more thing to say, carbs. though. So, I have one more thing to say, and that is, um, what was it again? Totally forgot it. Baba Ganoush. Man, what, what is wrong with me <laughs> recently? Yeah. I get so many things. I, I think I, I'm getting quite old already. See, Steve, I, I have already gray hair. You I don't. Have, I have random ones now and then, but also bright ginger ones. Oh. It's oh. really weird. <laughs> oh. Well, what is going on there? Do I you get- have kind of irish roots or something no <laughs> okay that was a little bit racist but um <laughs> fuck the irish no fuck david nolan <laughs> fuck david nolan for sure fuck david Nolan. we're not sponsoring him this time he's not sponsoring the podcast this week no um shit a eh? why, why did i oh uh, no now i know again and that is something uh with going to fail no i totally forgot it so again <laughs> Well, Eric Helms told me that the key to building muscle was drop sets and that you should do a one rep max and then do multiple drop sets until you can't do any more. 
Yes. And then you'll die, but be really big. That was our conversation. That sounds plausible. <laughs> I mean, that, that's probably really evidence-based, I would assume. It's coming from Eric. He is the evidence-based king. Totally. All right. So um, I fully trust him blindly. <laughs> Should we leave this episode here? And yeah. we will talk to you in a minute, although we won't. <laughs> totally. And maybe week. what I thought about will come Pop back up. to my mind and I can talk about it next week. Ah. <laughs> Guys, we'd love to hear, I, I'd love to hear, uh, Pascal will as well, your thoughts on deloads and holidays and active recovery phases. Let us know when the last time you had a week off the gym, when did that happen? Because I think it's been a very long time for me. I think I said to Pascal, it's been years since I've had more than like three days off the gym, um, which is a scary thought to be honest. So yeah, over and out. I know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Go on, then. I will talk about it in the next episode. Oh, cliffhanger. Yes. <laughs> Back. <laughs>